Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the second Asian Char and Tuesday event uh, with a focus on plug and charge and the uh, ISO 15118 uh, communication protocol. So this is going to be another uh, virtual seminar, which is brought by the members of uh, Charin of the CCS ISO 15118 uh, community. So today we will have presentations from uh, different stakeholders uh, in the plug and charge ecosystem. So what does plug and charge mean in its most basic form? You could say you arrive with your EV at the charging station, you plug in and in the background, your electronic contract with a charging point operator is recognized. And this without needing to scan any QR code, no need to swipe a credit card or a membership card, charging start. Once you unplug, the charging fee is automatically paid or it will come on your uh, monthly bill. So this is basically the plug and charge uh, principle uh, uh, told by a layman like me. But soon you will be hearing from the specialists like Autocrypt, Abject, Capco and Tritium that there is much more happening behind the scenes to make sure that there is a seamless experience, especially for the EV owner and then also for the charging point uh, operator, because also he will have or he or she will have a lot of benefits. Uh, but first, I would like to introduce you Klaas Braplo, who is the chairman of uh, Charing. Hi, Klaas. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Jack, and a warm welcome from my side to this Sharon Tuesday format. So I'm a bit missing the uh, conference format. That was not, not as bad as we plan for at least having one a year in every continent of the Charon membership base. Uh, but we are already at number eight of our Charon Tuesday series. We will have a third uh, one in, in Asia, and we are currently planning to extend that format for three global sharing Tuesdays uh, till end of the year and uh, yeah, luckily so that enables us uh, to save travel expenses and time and so it gives me the opportunity to participate in more events thanks to the um, experts and, and panelists and um, so we have uh, these different perspectives on board and a lot of uh, market knowledge from from experience by implementation from best practices and that gives us a quite good overview uh, tomorrow we will have a kickoff meeting uh, for um, charing PCI, public key infrastructure, and so we are striving for having an implementation in the European market uh, by uh, mid end of of next year, and figuring out uh, what happens tomorrow at the kickoff meeting. Um, as we have seen a tremendous demand from our membership base, please come to market with that technology and uh, don't discuss. Too much uh, what can be improved, changed, uh, miracles uh, around, and so I'm, I'm really looking really forward. And as that is a global technology, so I think we can work perfectly together in, in the North Americas, in Asia, and, and in Europe, and uh, we can benefit from each other's by our experience. And uh, we have a lot of Capco Autocrypt experiences and that hopefully um, get into the certificate policy. So that is one of the big assets of charring we created in our plug and charge task force. And so we have a policy at charring and we are committed to take responsibility in in um, in in um, in, um, govern, in 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 governing the B2G root CA. We'll um, hear more details uh, by today and I we um, stay you informed about the further processes within Charin concerning plug and charge. And that's all for customer sake and good for business. And so where is the hindering? So let's do it. And I wish us a good conference and hopefully seeing you next year, not virtually, but live. Good luck and hand over back to Jack. Thanks. Thank you very much, Klaas. So now back to the listeners, I would like to have some interaction uh, from you. So at a certain point in time during the presentations or before or after the presentation, you will receive a polling question that you can answer 
just by clicking on the screen. And this will be of interest for further discussions and to really understand a little bit more about how you feel about plug and charge. So here comes the first uh, polling question is basically to understand what is your understanding of plug and charge. So please feel free to fill it in. We give you 30 seconds for these uh, quick polls. And then we'll collect the answer. And so, yeah, we have already. OK. So we have very good 21%. And the uh, average is 50, 56, and 24 are so so. So now we will have our first speaker, Christian. Christian Hunter, he was the CEO of uh, Hubject. And Hubject has been on the forefront of the developments of plug and charge applications. And they've implemented uh, over 40 projects, and I assume in different parts of the world. So Christian, the, the floor is yours. Uh, let me first ask you, you have just seen the, the feedback coming from uh, the listeners. So you have a little bit of work to do to increase their know-how on plug and charge. <laughs> I will try my best, Chuck, I will try my best. Good morning, Thanks. good afternoon, everyone. Um, hello, um, my name is Christian. Um, thank you, Chuck, for your kind words. Um, and yeah, happy to be here today. Uh, and as the title of my presentation is already saying, I would like to share with you some knowledge from our projects we have done in the past, uh, in the last years. But also, I think, as you all know, ISO 15108 um, is, is a kind of complex topic. And this complexity is also uh, increasing, yeah, let's say some some hesitance in the market. So therefore, I thought it would be great if you maybe can start our discussion today to talk about the myth of ISO 15118. What do a lot of people believe uh, in regards of ISO 15118? And let's see if that's really the case, or if maybe if there's some misunderstandings in place, uh, some topics uh, which we hopefully can can adjust today. Yeah, who I am? I'm Christian. Um, 40 years old, I'm having the pleasure of working in the industry since a while. Um, I, I started uh, roughly 13 years ago working for e topics, and I'm having the pleasure again to work at Hubject since, since a long time as well, since 2012, and leading the company since 2015. And yeah, my, my, my uh, experience in regards of EVs is based on 50,000 kilometers of driving electric vehicles already. And therefore, I know a bit uh, of the challenges of uh, EV driver who, uh, who EV drivers are facing every day. And therefore, um, I really appreciate uh, the definition of the ISO 15108 standard because um, this standard and other activities will definitely help us all to improve um, the customer experience, which I think is the overall goal of all of us. Um, so, and yeah, I think as just as a starting point, um, as you all know, um, ISO 15108 is, can be a problem solver. Um, I really believe in this standard, not only because it helps us to avoid unsecure uh, tokens like RFID cards, which are used all over the world, not only in Europe, but all over the world um, quite often. Um, but most, nearly all RFID cards are based on unsecure technologies. So therefore, we definitely have the need for harmonization, but also standardization in the market in regards of IT security. And frankly speaking, um, I've met hundreds of companies already in the last years. Most of them are not yet focused that much on IT security. Simple reason, we have just started all together, the whole industry. Um, and therefore, of course, we, we have faced other challenges than IT security. But now the market is becoming more, more mature, which is great. We see more and more electric vehicles on the road. We see more and more models. We have seen bold statements uh, from, from, from countries like California, really impressive. They are now stopping or they plan to stop 
selling ICE cars from 2035 onwards. Other countries have done similar statements. So therefore now the market becomes more mature. So therefore I think it's it's a must have to also take care of of security. And, and as mentioned, ISO 15108 could be a good solution exactly for this topic to increase the security um, of all market participants, but also to have some kind of standardized, harmonized approach in place, because we also know that so far the level of sanitization is quite low in the industry for different reasons. Um, and I think every standard helps all of us to increase the security of investments. Um, there's nothing worse than investing into a piece of hardware and then after three, four, five years you need to replace it again because you have um, put, you have placed your bet on the wrong um, technology and therefore I really believe that we need more sanitization in the market and again ISO can be one way to approach. But the idea is simple as mentioned but the realization can be quite complex. Therefore on the next slide we see that um, yeah, there are some, or maybe a lot of myths in place um, for different reasons. And in general, I'm quite often getting the feedback that ISO 15108 and more specifically the plug and charge use case, um, that this is not really easy to implement. Um, there are question marks in place regarding the security level. Um, also quite often I hear that ISO 15108 is not in use at all. Um, so why should I as a company implement it? Um, it's even not yet standardized. And last but not least, also quite often um, I hear that people think that the standard is not a very open standard or not a neutral at all. So therefore, um, I hope that the following presentation is able to tackle some of the myths and hopefully also jointly together we are able to solve them. Uh, that would be the key focus of the presentation today. Let's start with the first one. Um, yeah, ISO 15108 is not easy to implement um, and can done only be can only be done by experts. Uh, some of the experts you see in the background, and of course uh, we all know, and I mentioned it in the beginning, IT security uh, is not yet um, the fundament of our daily work. Um, quite often we we discuss other topics which are more urgently needed than than. IT security requirements and who is in charge of uh, managing pass passwords and how many digits the passwords need to have and things like that. Um, but we also see that this is becoming more and more important and therefore I don't think that it's really that complex to implement um, because, and maybe we can switch on the next slide, because we see that the whole process is quite, quite, quite um, uh, slim. So we talk about six uh, different steps which need to be done that the whole plug and charge use case um, can, can be realized. And it starts quite simple with a, with, a, with a car manufacturer, with a car who needs to have the relevant certificates in place. Um, as you know, we talk in total about four certificates, the so-called V2G root certificate, which we will discuss a bit later on in detail but also three certificates for each object, so to say. So the electric vehicle, the car is having her own certificate. The charging station, of course, needs her own certificate. And last but not least, the customer contract. And only when these four contracts are coming together and then they are fitting together, we can establish a secure communication. And that's a reason why it all starts, so to say, with the electric vehicle, where everything needs to be installed, the provisioning certificate of the car, but also the root certificate. And then the end user can choose um, whatever mobility service provider he would like to choose. So he's completely free in his own choice, as long as the EMP, the e-mobility service providers offering um, the capabilities of plug and charge. Um, based on this decision, um, in step number three, the contract will be created, which is normally an automated process. This process uh, then creates the contract certificate, how it's called. And based on this contract certificate, um, the charging station can, for example, transfer this chart, this contract certificate to the electric vehicle. Last but not least, there's a roaming uh, request in place. It can be done via roaming platforms like Hubcheck or can be done bilaterally. 
there are different ways of how this can be done. And that's the whole seamless charging experience. So you see in reality, it's really not that complex. And also as, as shown on the next slide, um, the implementation nowadays becomes easier and, and, and easier. And though the lessons learned we have we have uh, got by, by doing a lot of projects is that the main challenge is not really to implement ISO 15108, but to prepare the organization that the organization is ready to use it properly. Um, as mentioned again, the security experience is quite low. A lot of companies haven't haven't taken this into account in the past, and therefore we are missing a bit these kind of topics when we are working with a lot of, of companies that they have the knowledge in place, so that they have, of course, an IT security expert in place, and also the proper organization needs to be established. But this is needed anyway to bring organizations to the next security level um, as the market becomes more and more mature and therefore I'm, I'm convinced that this will be one of the next steps that the ecosystem participants, companies who operate operating charging stations, companies who are issuing customer contracts, that they need to work on this. Um, and another, from my point of view, quite important lesson learned is if you're implementing plug and charge slash ISO 15108, please spend enough time for testing. That's what we have found out in our projects, that even if you're all relying on the same standard, um, as you all know, um, there are still some ways where you can go in this way or this way, unfortunately. So therefore, um, we have seen that this is definitely one of the most important lessons learned. Please spend time on testing, uh, and please uh, spend enough time on testing because that's the only way you can make sure that your whole implementation is working properly. And um, that's that's really, from our point of view, a very important um, topic we, we, we need to highlight again and again and again. The next move I would like to talk about is more about the security topic and uh, the picture. Why did I use a picture of a pancake here in, in, in this uh, move? Um, quite simple, because there's no one solution to establish um, security in an organization, especially when it's about e-mobility, where you need to collaborate with a lot of stakeholders um, from the market. As mentioned, either you are a charge point operator, then you need to collaborate with end customers, uh, with car manufacturers, with mobility service providers, and whoever else, roaming platforms. And to achieve then security is only possible if you're putting different layers over each other. So like a um, a tower of pancakes, so to say, um, and uh, that's exactly what is also needed uh, using ISO 15108 because, which is shown on the next slide, um, ISO 15108 is mainly a communication, it's only a communication protocol. So therefore, ISO 15108 is defining how the communication can be established between the different stakeholders. Um, but it's not defining at all how the security can be can be reached. That needs to be done by other standards, which are in place, plenty of them. Um, and ISO is just uh, requesting that these other standards are being used, um, but it's not solving all the issues. And that's the reason why I think it's also maybe not, not the right assumption saying ISO 15108 needs to solve all these open questions because therefore we have other standards in place. And on the next slide, um, you, you also see that, as mentioned, that the communication, that ISO is only a communication protocol. Therefore, uh, we need other mechanisms, other tools, like, for example, the IT certificates we are talking about um, to really, really ensure a secure ecosystem. And um, as mentioned, therefore, security comes by design slash by, by the system, but not purely by using a communication protocol like ISO 1500. Okay, then the next myth um, I would like to talk about is uh, the, the myth that ISO 1500 is not being used. Um, I think that can be, a, a, there I have a very quick answer, which you can see on the next slide, seeing that already a lot of companies, and this is just a, maybe highlighting some of the companies, I'm quite sure that there are many, many other companies who are either already have announced that they are implementing um, ISO 1508, or already have a productive solution in place, or did already a press release on these topics. And I'm quite sure that I've missed some or a lot of companies 
who already uh, you who are already using plug and charge in ISO 1.8 as well. So therefore, if you know more companies, I need to adhere to this list. Please let me know. Happy to do so. Um, but it really shows that ISO 1.8 is already accepted by a lot of also a lot of important market participants. So therefore, from my point of view, it's definitely one of the of the feature services everyone needs to to implement to offer um, quite soon. Okay, then the next topic I would like to talk about is about uh, uh, that maybe this is not a standard. And as we all know, standards are quite important. They are so important that everyone should have their own one, <laughs> as you can see uh, in the picture. Um, and um, of course, that's that's completely not um, the case. ISO 1500 is, of course, um, um, a standard. In fact, it's already in place since nearly 10 years, nine years already. So it was already invented in the beginning of the e-mobility industry. And as you can see on the next slide, um, um, it's already being part of the CCS standard since a long time, um, which I think is also very important to mention. So therefore, if you're relying on charging hardware, which is using the CCS standard, then most of the work is already done normally for using ISO 15518. Um, also, as discussed before, most of the hardware suppliers in the global market already have integrated this um, standard in their products or are already working on integrating it. And also, and you see it in the press releases, they are, uh, there's a high number of, of car manufacturers who already have announced that uh, plug and charge is implemented. Here are some listed. So Smart was one of the first, I think, in 2017. Um, but since then, a lot of a lot of other OEMs, uh, not only European ones, uh, but also international OEMs, OEMs from the from the North American market, from the Asian market, have announced the implementation and the and the plan to offer this um, custom experience to their customers. Um, quite soon. So therefore, I think again that it's already time um, to, to to use it um, for everyone, um, and I think that's that's important to mention. Last but not least, the neutrality topic, or maybe that it's not open enough. Um, and of course, as you know, neutrality, op neutrality, openness, um, that really depends on the perspective you have to the market. Um, in in general. Um, I by myself, but also we as Hubcheck, we define neutrality, neutrality and openness, of course, based on the fact if you're using open source licenses and if you're offering your protocols uh, as, as open source, but also it's the way how you're working with companies and other stakeholders. And from my point of view, I think that's quite important to mention that um, we only achieve um, a better acceptance of e-mobility by working jointly together and not by separating the industry in different groups, um, depending on size and budgets. And therefore, we really like to invite um, all the companies in the market, all the stakeholders in the market um, to, to work together, especially when it's about plug and charge, because of course, everything can be improved. Um, plug and charge is maybe not yet perfect, but it needs to be perfect, that's a different story, but we can only achieve something better if we are all working together. And working together means also testing specific things, making experiences, collecting experiences, see what's working, what's not working. And therefore, as mentioned on the next slide, we definitely would like to, to, to invite more companies um, to work on this topic. And uh, maybe to, as a kind of summary, as Hubcheck, of course, we have uh, invested a lot in the last years in regards of, of ISO 15518, um, but also we needed to do so because uh, to make the whole approach working, you need, for example, the so-called V2G UCA. But there is no one yet except Hubcheck on a global level who's operating a productive V2G UCA, which is certified by external um, security auditors. And therefore, we are still the only one doing so. If that's the right approach, I have my doubts, frankly speaking, but it's needed that the whole ecosystem is working. And therefore, we really would like to invite the industry to discuss how this can be done in a different approach, because in the end, you need at least one V2G would say to make it work. If that needs to be operated by object, no, of course not. But we need to do it right now because there's no alternative. And therefore, 
we definitely encourage um, all the market participants to reach out to us to work with us on topics like cross certification so that you can use different UCAs and different continents for example to establish a collaboration there but also um, and I think most of you know it already um, we really encourage Charin to um, take over more responsibility in this topic for example by discussing if it could be a good opportunity that Charin is maybe operating a V2G UCA or other activities around this topic um, because we also see that the success of, of the whole approach shouldn't be only linked by one or two or three companies in the market. It needs to be a joint approach as discussed and therefore we need to we need to solve the last question marks. We still have maybe the last barriers need to be reduced um, by, by working um, jointly. Okay, then I see Chuck, uh, he's already uh, remembering me that I have run out of time. So thank you again for listening to me. As mentioned, please feel free to reach out to me. You, here you see my contact data. Happy to discuss whatever topic you would like to discuss. And also, please feel free to reach out to me if you have a different perspective. As mentioned, I think the myths we just discussed are quite important to be solved. But maybe you have different um, perspectives, different opinions you would like to add. Happy to do so. Happy to reach out to me every time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christian. So as the audience, you can send any questions you have for the moment. You can use them either now or at a later stage when we have uh, some uh, discussions together. Christian, I have just one, uh, one simple question for you. You emphasize that testing is so important. Uh, Charon is organizing those festivals three times a year, pre-COVID. Hopefully, post-COVID, we will start again. Um, does uh, the festival also organize a plug and charge event, or is that separate? Um, it's, it's, it's included in <coughs> party at least, um, but I can only encourage um, the Charon organization maybe also offer the possibility to test uh, productive um, UCAs, for example, um, so that the participants can really see if their implementation is not only working under, uh, so to say, lab, lab yeah. conditions, but also can work under real life conditions. And I think yeah. it would be great to discuss how this can be, can be done. It's okay. currently planned for the Europest Festival in April next year, and so we are hopefully having that as a physical meeting and that is the current plan to incorporate that activities into the testable format and afterwards to spread it to Asia and the US. So I have to leave now. Thank you very much for the first. Um, probably I can dial in a bit later. Uh, good luck for the rest of the conference. Bye. Yeah. Thank you, Klaus. Uh, so now you as a listener, the next polling question is coming out. So please vote you have another 20 seconds and then um, then we will get the results soon So 58% believe that plug and charge will not become mainstream, while 42% believe it will become mainstream. So let's go now to the next uh, speaker. Uh, that's uh, Nathan Dunlop. Uh, he's the head of marketing of uh, marketing strategy, market strategy, sorry, of Tritium. And Tritium is uh, a pioneer in the development of uh, High power chargers with plug and charge uh, facilities. So, Nathan, before you start uh, your uh, presentation, what do you think of the poll that just came in saying that 58% of the listeners don't believe that plug and charge will become uh, mainstream? Hi. Switch on your microphone. I don't hear you. Thank you. Uh, I was muted by the organizer. <laughs> um, no, that's okay. Um, no, yes. Yeah, so, uh, thank you for having me, Yarks. It's good to be here. Um, 
look, I think it's half and half at this point. Uh, we can talk about some of the reasons in the presentation, but look, uh, I'd love to see it be more adopted. But I think yes, it's for the for those people that uh, listen to Christian's presentation. Thank you for that, Christian. Um, yeah, there's some still challenges that people think in their head around you know, how uh, complicated it is to implement. Um, and how quickly you can get it kind of working and, and what the relevance will actually be and how many cars will come to market. So, um, look, I think there's still doubt in people's minds, but look, let's talk about some of that. But I think it would be, it's certainly useful to improve the customer experience if we can actually get this implemented. All right, so I'll start off the presentation. Um, thank you for that. I mean. For those of you not familiar with Tritium, uh, we are a charging manufacturer uh, based out of Brisbane, Australia. We also have uh, locations in Amsterdam, uh, in the Netherlands, and then in Los Angeles, California. Um, so we're a global manufacturer of electric vehicle chargers. Um, you're most probably familiar with seeing this picture, which is the Arnity project, which Tritium is um, you know, working closely with Arnity to, to deploy 350 kilowatt chargers around Europe. Um, we also have a broad portfolio of 50 kilowatt chargers that are deployed in Europe. We also have chargers uh, based in the United States, pretty much broadly across the whole of the United States, and then you know some in Australia and New Zealand. We're starting to get some chargers in Asia, but uh, limited at this point. Um, next slide, please. <clears throat> So just a quick rundown, we have around 600,000 charging sessions uh, and we've delivered you know, around 7.5 gigawatt hours of, of energy. Um, this slide's a little bit old, it's now you know, probably even double that. Um, I think I'm updating it recently, but our vision is to, de is to deploy charges to enable people to have energy freedom. And that's where they can drive their vehicle um, to wherever they want and not be constrained by range and be able to, to be trust that there's a fast charger there that can get them on their way and uh, continue to do their journey. Uh, next slide, thank you. Um, as you can see, you know, there's a pretty important uh, uh, car that came out last year, which was the Porsche Taycan. This one really set the set the record of you know what can be done with a charger and what can be done with a vehicle. 264 kilowatts of charge is really impressive, and that was is the top of the market at the moment around what you can do. And this is where we're starting to think about you know getting that customer experience back to what people uh, drivers can have the experience of what they do in a petrol car. Next slide. Um, quickly go through this. We have uh, in about 30 countries. And next slide, thank you. Um, and I think what we what we're trying to communicate here around fast charges is that when fast charges are deployed, people can really trust that they can adopt an electric vehicle. And this is just the, the grounding uh, reasoning of why you, you can then deploy electric vehicles and then have greater EV adoption. Next slide, thank you. <clears throat> So why is this happening? Uh, we we know that this is happening because of the combustion engine vehicles are pretty much peaked according to Bloomberg New Energy Finance. We know that uh, battery electrics are going to be only rising from here, um, and this is setting up setting us up to have this big transition to electric vehicles. And we'll get to plug and charge, and we'll talk about that in a few slides. Next one, thank you. Um, very quickly, in Europe, we know that this this market is being you know, driven by the penalties that are in the market. And that's why we're starting to see this big transition uh, originally into these electric vehicles. And the VW ID3 is one of those ones that are paving the way in the past few weeks, selling many, many vehicles. Next slide, thank you. Um, the battery prices continue to come down. We're already understanding that we're getting close to $100 per kilowatt hour, and this is really driving the adoption for those who are not familiar. But I think most of us are familiar on this call with Charon. Uh, next slide, thank you. So where are we at? We're at the point where we're beginning this big transition from uh, from traditional fossil fuels into the electric grid. Um, and there's new technology emerging all the time. Tritium was one of the first deployment uh, of plug and charge technology. So we've actually got that live now on the charges that are in Europe, largely on the IONT project site, so the 350 kilowatt charges. Um, and it's now ready to go. Um, we're one of the first charging manufacturers to deploy 1511.8. But I, today I want to talk about more about the business case for, for actually why it matters and why things are actually happening with 1511.8 plug and charge. So next slide, please. 
um, just a few examples of who they are in the in the market. Um, you can see there's a broad range of, of charging operators and there's a broad range of power levels that people are putting them at different locations. They all have relevance to plug and charge because there's different ways that people use the vehicle and use the way they want to charge. So on highway rest stops, if you want a very quick experience, uh, on retail they're more likely to stay for a little bit longer. Um, next slide please. What we see though is the convergence of, of industries. They're looking to kind of come together and start to provide these services. So you have a very broad range of people in the market who are starting to provide you know, charging services to drivers, whether that be in the public space or in the private space. I believe that 1511A is relevant in both just because of the way that you interact with the vehicle. It can make the, it can smooth out the customer experience. Uh, next slide, please. So, the, the key the key thing to remember in the market in the public space especially is that there's competing interests coming from you know a broad range of providers so utilities are starting to compete in this space uh, automotives are starting to deploy their networks uh, we have fuel operators who are starting to think about how is their business going to be affected in the future because of this transition to electric vehicles and then we have pure place cpos or charge point operators and charge point operators are those that are setting up a business just to effectively run a business that does charging services and not doing any cross-sell uh, from their existing operations. So 15 is interesting because uh, everyone has something to gain in this market and everyone can start to be bundling different opportunities and different services. So from a perspective of a utility, I mean, why is 15 important to them? Well, maybe they can start to be able to do bundling where you're starting to uh, cross-sell from your existing utility tariff in the residential space and then start to build offers that enable customers to to use plug and charge and have it build automatically through to their existing utility connection. What plug and charge does or 1511.8 does is actually centralizes the, the interaction of the charger or the charging session inside the vehicle. That's important for automakers especially because you're starting to centralize the access to the customer inside the vehicle. So you're controlling the session of the charger through the through the car itself. So when you're going and plugging in a car and it automatically authenticates through this the back end certificates, the, the touch point at the charger is effectively eliminated. So you start to centralize that that relationship inside the vehicle. Um, what does that mean for autos? It means you probably have an easier access to start bundling charging with the purchase of a vehicle. From a fuel operator perspective, this brings them much more into the realm where they're more comfortable with fuel cards. So in the United States, in Europe, Australia, we have you know, a large penetration of commercial fuel cards where uh, you have a, com a company car and you can charge the fuel straight to that card. This is another way of making that seamless uh, touch point where the fuel operator can touch, can have, a, can have the car set up as the fuel card effectively. It gives you an easier path to start selling other services and getting people into the retail store and starting to bill extras into that, um, you know, potentially onto the company account, which is, you know, more easy to be able to spend money on. Charge point operators are the ones that are probably less relevant in this in this landscape just because they don't have the ability to cross sell or upsell. Potentially in the future, they may have the ability to start selling other services uh, or bundling things or packaging up you know different bundles of offerings to drivers themselves but in this in this context of where the customer relationship is centralized to the vehicle the cpo is probably the one that loses out most next slide please so how does it work uh i think we jumped in pretty quickly we're having a bit of a discussion here following christian's uh, christian's presentation Number one, the vehicle passes a certificate to the charger. So uh, the, the car itself is the authentication mechanism and it's then being validated in the cloud, which is number two, where it's sent up to the cloud. You have a validation, the certificate is then approved in step three, and then the charger is enabled to, to start its session. That's, a, that's in a nutshell what plug and charge is doing in 1511.8. Next slide, please. So we're getting away from these, from the fuel cars. We're getting away from having to carry multiple fuel cars. And in some jurisdictions, so in Europe especially, this has largely been solved, where you have roaming agreements that are very well established now. In the United States, it's a little bit less established. And in Asia, we're having, we're at the inception really, because we don't have as much crossing of borders to charging operators. So 
what plugin charge does is enables you to be able to roam more freely because the the certificates will be able to be validated cross network um, which enables you to then be able to be billed centrally for you know wherever you go and it really removes that friction for the customer which is potentially you know one of those things that really improves the customer experience for the the driver itself next slide so as the customer experience improves the ways that it really improves for the driver is that you have a streamlined membership. You're able to roam more freely. You're able to be able to be billed centrally. You're able to just not have to be carrying around multiple cards or having multiple uh, accounts on your smartphone. It just removes that that annoyance of of not knowing if you're eligible to charge this network and if you get the preferred rates. Um, much easier to be able to centralize that all into the car where it's always carried with you. Um, In-card charge control I spoke about was that this is centralizing the touch points of the charger inside the vehicle. Your control of the charger has some interesting implications. Potentially, you'll be able to remove the buttons off of the charger or remove the screen off of the charger, much like a Tesla supercharger looks like today. Um, potentially, that commoditizes the industry a little bit more, um, but maybe you're able to save some costs there and be able to deploy more electric vehicle fast chargers. Christian already spoke about the security. We have improved data security in 1511.8 just through the use of these cryptographic techniques, being able to make sure that certificates are, um, are validated in the cloud. This is much more secure than the RFID equivalent. And the enhanced roaming is the ability, as I said, you can kind of have that identification layer in the vehicle and be able to roam freely and know that you'll be able to be you know, validated by the charger itself. Next slide, please. So, we spoke about a little bit before, who is going to fight to own the plug and charge experience? So let's talk about that. Next slide. So as I mentioned, the CPOs are probably the ones that lose out most here. Automakers, tech players, and utilities are really the ones that are going to be fighting for this. I add tech players here just because they have some control already inside the vehicle. Let's talk about those. Next slide, please. So as mentioned, automakers may secure the ownership of the charging experience just because the in-screen controls are in the vehicle. This is a Tesla uh, below, but you're able to see that the the control of the charger and the the information that's showing on the on the charger itself is now inside the vehicle. This gives you the ability to start to do interesting things, push offers to the customer itself, potentially use a bundled account where the, the charging is already paid for they may be able to win in this space because they might be able to seize control of the charging experience just because the, the information is readily available inside the vehicle itself. Next slide. The tech players already have an advantage in this space. And you recently saw uh, a few months ago now that Google Maps started to include charging locations on the, on the map itself. I guess the next step for we can see that going is that Android Auto and Apple CarPlay are really good over the top strategic plays from the from the technology players to gain access to the customer ex the experience and the customer relationship inside the vehicle. Potentially, this is just another outlet for a tech player to come in and capture the data and extend the tech ecosystem to charging itself. If you're able to um, gain control or gain you know much more of the uh, the, the span of the customer relationship, you may be able to then be the one who controls what the pricing structure looks like, what the bundling opportunities look like, and what people what people pay or what people's you know payment mechanism is to actually pay for a charging session itself. Of course, this is not right now in the future, but potentially at some point going forward, we'll start to see these uh, these consolidation plays from the from the large scale tech players who want to be clipping the ticket or taking a small percentage of payment fees. Next slide, please. And as I mentioned earlier, utilities may be able to extend their relationship into the public space. So just to reiterate that, the utilities have largely been refined to uh, the public space historically, where you have a you know have a behind the meter activity, which your customer is billed for um, at their residential premises. Electric vehicles give the utility an opportunity to expand into the public space for the first time ever. They are able to potentially start to be selling electricity everywhere. Um, this is a massive opportunity for them. 
they may be able to start securing these uh, these relationships through plug and charge or through the ability to bundle or validate a customer's charging session and be able to centralize billing. Um, you're starting to see interesting crossover plays across industry. Volkswagen Ely um, is is a is obviously a Volt is a automotive player, but they're entering a utility space. So the, the lines are beginning to blur across industry around who is playing in what space and who will actually contest for the energy supply for a uh, the charging session itself. Next slide, please. Um, I think we're almost there. I mean, the key message from this presentation is that whoever controls the charging, the, the, the customer relationship or the customer experience is likely to win in this environment. And that is the business case for, for 1511.8 plug and charge. It's centralizing and controlling the, the customer relationship. If you're able to do that, you have a massive advantage and that will fund the business case to do your development or to be, continue developing 1511.8 plug and charge. I have one question for you. Um, you mentioned that the CPO would be the weakest link uh, in the ecosystem of e-mobility. What does that mean for uh, uh, the, the future of charging? That all the charging operators will be big companies? Well, I don't want to say and it's not possible to to be a small company and be a charge point operator. I think there's certainly you know, potential there in the future. It's a very hard business model to make work if you don't have the ability to cross sell or to upsell into different places. Just because the tariff structures of electricity mm -hmm. itself are not really that favorable um, to, to fast charging, especially in the public space. You're starting to see those things change a little bit. Like in California, um, we have demand charge holidays where the rate structure or the tariff structure has started to change to be a little bit more friendly to, to charge point operators. Um, I think you'll probably see um, a bit of a gold rush happening. So charge point operators mm -hmm. deploying a lot of charges with the, with the actual intent to sell them onto larger corporates. So you're starting to see that already mm -hmm. in Europe where um, yeah. there's a lot of M&A activity where people are, are building a charge network just to kind of sell it to a big utility or a big automotive player. Okay, so that also means I need to invest in the right type of chargers and probably as big as possible to make, of to course. make it attractive. Well, I mean, biggest possible is is uh, is interesting. Um, we're start we're seeing probably around the 150 kilowatt mark, especially in the in the Western markets at the moment, be the sweet spot. 350 kilowatt is really just a is a massive amount of infrastructure you need to be building. Um, you need to have pretty good foresight on what the vehicles are going to look like in the next five to ten years to to be able to make that work. Um, we're also seeing that people are starting to rip out their 50 kilowatt chargers and replace them with a higher power charger just because they're getting much more traffic at those busy sites. So potentially uh, busy sites will be upgraded and you start to see um, those 50 kilowatt or le lower, lower power chargers relocated to less busier sites. Um, how does that interact with plug and charge? I mean, I don't think the customer minds what the power level is as long as they have the customer experience and the functionality that they expect at all charges. Um, doesn't really matter. Right. They're going there with the intent of charging and having a seamless experience. And that's what matters to the customer. Okay. We have also one question from the audience. And um, the question is, what happens when I come up to a charger with a plug and charge feature, but I don't have a contract? Can I still charge my EV with that charger? Yeah, so at the moment, the, the chargers obviously still have a screen or they still have an interface. Um, the point I was making is that maybe in the future, you can start to remove that much like a Tesla supercharger has. But at the moment, yes, there's always still either um, RFID, um, potentially mm -hmm. a credit card reader on those chargers. And, and oftentimes there may even be a smartphone app that you can initiate the charging session from. So there's certainly a lot of ways to pay. Um, it's just that potentially the plug and charge, that it, it, gives, it gives the operator more flexibility to start doing other interesting tariffs, designs or bundles. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I think the, probably the most expensive way will be obviously to pay by credit card, um, just because there's obviously fees and things that are associated with that that have to be paid for. Uh, and typically, the way the charge point operator wants to bill is that they want to give a preference to their membership base. Um, so oftentimes paying directly at the charger may be a little bit more expensive uh, than using mm -hmm. you know, whatever 
the membership platform is. So you you will see regulations as well that are emerging in a lot of places where there has to be the ability to make payment at a charger. What governments and regulators don't want to see is that people get stranded at a charger or they're not able to make use of a charging right. asset. There will be regulations that say, at minimum, you need to be able to make payment via a credit card or a phone call. Okay, all right. All right, thank you, Dan. Thank you very thank much. You. Thanks. Um, I don't see any other question coming in, so we'll pick it up later. Okay. okay. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for listening. Thank you. Thank you, Nathan. Then we'll go to our next uh, polling question. Will plug and charge be a game changer for increased e mobility in your region? So basically focusing on roaming. And our third speaker will be Jason Yo. He's the chief security evangelist and vice president of the business development at uh, AutoCrypt. And AutoCrypt is a mobility security provider offering total security solutions for connected vehicles. So what did come out of the poll is basically 50-50. That's, that's nice. So Jason, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Hi, Jason. So, hello, how are you? Hi, fine. Did you see the poll that came out? If um, plug and charge will be an important step in, um, uh, will be, sorry, will be a game changer for increased uh, e mobility in your region. So it's like 50 50. <laughs> I think we're all kind of um, not exactly sure what the, the future will be, but I think that PNC is probably going to be a very important first step to how the business is run in the future, personally and uh, okay. as a company. Okay, so I give you the floor now. Here you go. Oh, thank you very much. Um, hello, uh, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. This is my fourth year here uh, under a different company name, um, but I'll, I'll ex get uh, deeper into and, and explain what's happened with our company and uh, as we introduce it. Um, my name is Jason Yu. I'm the chief evangelist uh, for AutoCrypt. Um, and we're usually brought in to talk about cybersecurity, but um, this presentation is a little bit different um, because um, while there's uh, always considerations about security by design and having security practices involved, I think that's much more of a specialized um, topic to talk about. So uh, what I want to talk about today um, a little bit more is um, the result of how stakeholders in the EV charging area are beginning to ask us how they can get ready for a plug-in charge. Um, and so I thought it would be helpful for all of us to see how the major stakeholders uh, need to do what, what they would need to do in, in order to prepare for PNC. Next. Uh, so the uh, just a brief, we'll just go over a short introduction of the company, uh, given the time restrictions. Um, so, so uh, we are AutoCrypt. We're based in Seoul, Korea. Uh, we have branch offices in the four areas that we see. We're particularly um, quite active right now in, in China and Japan um, and expanding our business in the States. Uh, we're established in August of uh, last year. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and the area for EV charging is just a part of what we do. Um, so I don't want to go into too, uh, in too much detail, but uh, we're concerned with the in-car traffic. So there's the security within the car, um, and that's what's called an automotive or advanced firewall for us. Um, so that's, we try to protect the car itself from external threats and also um, bad traffic that may be going um, inside the, the car itself. Um, and then uh, there's V2X security, which means, um, you know, generally speaking, cars communicating with other cars, with other roadside equipment, traffic signals, what have you, anything that's external or, or outside the car. 
Um, and then uh, we also uh, work with V2D, which is vehicle to device, and we differentiate that because that incorporates uh, not only the mobile device, but a cloud server to be able to bring uh, more convenient services for not only um, vehicle users, but also pedestrians as well. Um, and V2G, of course, um, I, and I just want to clear up some terminology here. Uh, V2G here doesn't mean um, bi-directional charging. Uh, it simply means connecting to the grid or, or the electricity provider. Um, and I think it, we should all be reminded that plug-in charge is the first technology that connects uh, the vehicle to the grid um, and um, the wireless charging and bi-directional charging, which is what uh, often called V2D, uh, V2G now by a lot of uh, different experts are, are the coming technologies. So basically um, the, the car connecting to a grid and all the benefits that come, PNC is really the first one. Um, and you heard Christian talk a little bit about the V2G route. So, um, I think there, I just don't want there to be any more confusion for us. When the car connects to a electric, electric, electric grid, uh, we're talking about the V2G in, the, in that sense. Um, and finally, um, we, there's a lot of uh, user data that can be utilized um, and, and can be quite useful. So we also uh, help find solutions and services so that companies can use all of the data that comes out of all of these communications um, and use it for different sets of applications, for example, being fleet management services. Next slide, please. Uh, before AutoCrypt was found in August of 2019, um, actually the company was incubated under Penta Security. So I, the last three years I've been attending these these events as uh, under Penta Security. Um, Penta Security was started in 1997, but um, the, the company itself, uh, we started dealing with automotive security in 2007. Um, and right now, um, AutoCrypt is the head of security for almost all of the smart highway projects. So uh, when cars are being tested to communicate with each other, with roadside devices, with traffic signals, and all of the V2X applications that I talked about earlier, um, we are uh, in charge of the, the security components, both at the endpoint and the infrastructure levels. Next slide, please. So that's a quick uh, wrap up of the company introduction. Um, now I'd like to talk about uh, PNC enablement by stakeholder. So this is kind of the overall picture and, and try to make it as simple as possible with different colors and, and whatnot. But um, if you look to the left side, uh, you see the OEM PKI. Um, the OEMs is they're really, really their responsibility to install the provisioning certificates, um, and which kind of uh, builds the trust for, is, is really the proof of the, the car itself, it's the entity. Um, and then so that, uh, provisioning certificates needs to be installed within the car and also needs to be um, placed in a separate pool so that it could be accessed by mobility operators or EMSPs. Um, and the, uh, the provisioning cert uh, and the charge point cert, um, so basically the, the, the car and the, the EV charger um, those certificates are used to identify each other to be able to trust each other. Uh, when you look at the green um, lines, uh, the, the important thing there is a contract certificate. Um, and uh, this is really the, uh, the customer's information to be able to authorize the charging for PNC services in the first place. Um, and I'll go through all of these in detail in a little bit, but this is kind of the overall picture. Um, so the solid lines are, are, are the different certificates that need to be in place for a plug and charge ecosystem to work. Now the dotted lines are just as important because those are the validation areas. So um, for example, uh, the MO can be validated by the OEM. Uh, when they receive their provisioning cert certificate so that, and this is all really just to be able to have a uh, 
high level of security and trust so that everyone could be able to um, to trust each other. Um, so the MO needs to be validated by the OEM. The EV needs to be validated by the CPO. And the CPO needs to be valid, validated by the MO and the V2G root CA. Um, so uh, this is the overall picture. Um, so what does this all mean? Um, so I'll, I'll just try to take it by stakeholder. So if you could go to the next slide. Uh, we've talked to OEMs um, and uh, OEMs, in order to get ready for plug-in charge, um, they essentially need cars that can communicate with other stakeholders using the um, ISO 15118 standard. Um, and uh, this is just another uh, way of saying that they need communication modules in the cars um, and to be able to have a PKI that could support these modules. Um, and modules, what I mean by modules, it basically um, is, is the modem and, and the ability to be able to have software code onto those modems to be able to communicate using the ISO 15118 standard. So um, the, the vehicles would be able to receive, store, and validate provisioning certificates. Um, and these are modules, these are software, so they need to be updated. Um, uh, what's the OEM PKI for? They need to be able to install the um, certificates into the vehicles before they roll off the lot. Um, they need to be able to distribute these same certificates to a pool so that uh, a mobility operator can get access to them. Um, and then uh, they need to be able to provide the provisioning certificate validation to the MO. So they need to be able to have a, a PKI in place to be able to trust the MO. Um, now, OEMs, uh, we think, um, and in most likelihood, I, I think they're going to manage their own PKI infra. Um, but an interesting question um, comes up when it comes to the provisioning certificate pools. So this is, uh, in, in uh, most instances, it, it, this is going to be outside of the OEM PKI for security reasons. Um, so the question becomes, are they going to have their own provisioning certificate pool? Or are they going to be able to use a service? I think both are very feasible ways to be able to, um, um, to manage the, the provisioning certificates outside their own PKI infra. Um, but this becomes a, a, a real bio, a, a valid question when they think about the cars um, that they manufacture and they export into foreign markets. Um, and how are those cars going to be identified in the foreign market that they're exported to? Um, and I, I, I think, again, uh, the idea of are they going to operate their own or are they going to use a service will become an uh, important question. Next slide, please. Uh, charge point operators have a, a very important role in PNC as well. Uh, so they need to um, be able to uh, have, uh, they need communication modules on the chargers. Now, um, you know, companies like Tritium um, are really the advanced, uh, and they're one of the first to be able to manufacture uh, charging points that come PNC ready. Um, but um, in any case, all of these chargers you need to have chargers that can communicate based on 15118 as well. So it's either going to be the uh, charging point manufacturers or the charge point operators that are going to try to make these happen. And these are modules just like the ones in the cars. Uh, generally speaking, they're going to be modems that have software on them, and that software needs to be updated, uh, like all IoT endpoints in a secure system. Um, and CPOs will also need to have uh, some sort of a PKI. And the reason um, that they need the PKI is uh, to be able to distribute uh, the contract certificates from the MO um, to, the EV, to the EV and the EVSE. Uh, they need to be able to generate charge point certificates. Um, they need to be able to provide validation for the charge points. So this also becomes a, a, a question of uh, our CPO is going to uh, gen, uh, build out their own solution and infrastructure, or are they going to be able to use a service? Uh, next slide, please. 
No, um, the MOs are basically facing the customers um, from a PKI standpoint, and they're they're the one the primary providers for AV owners um, to receive uh, all of the the great things that come with um, PNC technology. So um, the MOs would be responsible for aggregating all of the users um, and also uh, gathering the provisioning certificates of those users and, and the cars that they drive. Um, and through that information, they could generate contract certificates we, th that can be used to initiate um, plug and charge. So for mobility operators, when they ask us what they need to start uh, to have ready in order to be ready for this um, PKI-based um, plug and charge revolution, um, they, uh, they first need a, some sort of a front end uh, to be able to sign up customers um, uh, for plug and charge. And you know this, of course, is either a web or mobile uh, front end uh, uh, page or app uh, that that needs to be built out in order to be able to aggregate the users and get all the information that they need to be able to generate the contract certificate. Now, um, the MO PKI that could also be a solution or a service as well. In other words, an MO can sit down and say, "Hey, we want to build out our own PKI." We don't think that's um, really necessary, but you know they can also use a service as well. Uh, and the, the PKI is basically to um, receive the provisioning certificates, so their users' car information um, from the pool, uh, the provisioning certificate pool, and then to distribute the contract certificate to be able to initiate all of the charging. Next slide, please. Uh, just want to say one last word about a CPS uh, certificate Jason? service. Hi, Jason. I have one. Sorry to interrupt you because I got a feedback from uh, listeners and they would like to know what is the meaning of PKI, CA, VA, and MO. I think oh, it's, it's important. Um, yeah, if you, if you could um, go back to the earlier slide that shows the overall um, pattern, I'd be very happy to explain it. Um, like I said, we're from uh, IT security background. PKI is really a uh, part of our DNA. So when we look at a PKI um, um, structure, uh, it, it's really, um, we think about something that, um, it, if something generates, for example, on the OEM side, if it generates a provisioning certificate pool and it distributes something, um, that's the certificate authority um, that distributes uh, the certificate out there but there's so that's the certificate authority but if you look at the VA that's called a, a validation authority so you have to keep the validating part of the PKI in in a, in a separate um, part of the PKI infra overall and and you have those two separate entities and those are um, under the the, the, the trust anchor of the root CA and, and I'm sure root CA is something that you hear all the time that's ultimately the the very neutral area of trust anchor that allows um, that says that the, the authorities underneath are can be trusted so um, that's kind of like the neutral area and that's why you see a root CA on all on all of the different areas so the way a PKI works is uh, when uh, a a cert is generated or downloaded, it goes up this trust anchor um, all the way up to the root CA to be able to um, ascertain that all of the different players within that PKI can be trusted. And I'm, I really wish there was a better way for me to explain that, but um, that's the, really the, the simplest way I can do it right now. Uh, so we talked about the OEM, the, the CPU, and the MO, like what they need to do. Um, and there's just one more part, um, and, and that's called the Certificate Provisioning Service. And this was in the overall um, the area as well. And this is really just for um, the sake of running a smooth business in a PNC environment. Um, and in most cases, uh, it, we expect this to be some sort of a neutral uh, public agency 
um, that's going to safeguard all the contract certificates that have already been made. So if an MO um, sends over a contract certificate to the EV and it begins charging, it really doesn't make any sense for the next time when this same customer tries to charge using plug and charge. It doesn't make any um, sense for this, the, a new contract certificate to be generated again. So it it's really just kind of like a um, a safeguard of existing customers that can be trusted, um, and um, that and that's called a a uh, certificate provisioning service. And um, the way that they um, keep and and distribute all of the the contract certificate pool for easy convenience for subsequent chargings is going to be the contract certificate pool. So. Um, and again, we think that this is going to be a neutral public agency um, to manage its own PKI. So uh, this is it's not a huge volume of business. It, it just has to be someone that could be trusted within a local um, PNC charging system to be able to um, keep um, all of the existing contract certificates available for a, a uh, quickness and convenience on subsequent charges. Next slide, please. So, of course, um, you know, these are, uh, there are a lot of questions that still remain. Um, I hope that I was able to kind of clear up what each of the stakeholders would need to have ready um, in, in order to be ready for PNC. Um, and um, I just kind of wanted to point out some of the more prominent questions that, that are apparent to us. Um, and these are questions for stakeholders. So this is really um, for CPOs uh, and charge point manufacturers and, and mobility operators um, that really want to, to get into this game, uh, the, the PNC uh, technology at some point, but aren't really sure um, how they're going to be able to do so. Um, so generally speaking, if you want to get into PNC, is I, I think the the, the uh, first question I would ask is is my local EV <clears throat> charging ecosystem ready? Um, so are there PNC ready EVs available? Um, the Porsche Taycan is is it was the first one that that came out. Um, is there a B2G Route CA available, which Christian talked about earlier with with Hubject? Um, and is there going to be a, a CPS that I mentioned on the previous slide? Uh, that will be able to provide contract certificate pool services. Um, and uh, another key question that I brought over many times is, do I build my own PKI or do I use some sort of a service, um, a PKI as a service? Um, and, um, the, and the thing that we always tell our clients is the PKI process is, is very secure, um, but the infrastructure is just as important and the maintenance of that infrastructure is is very complicated um, so if you're not clear about the um, pki process a sauce model would be recommended um, to take just two examples um, of why a sauce my model might be attractive to you is if you run a pki you need to have some sort of a certificate policy a certificate practice statement um, and this allows your PKI to be trusted by other PKIs that are either operating in your local environment or for interoperable reasons in different regions. Um, and also software needs to be updated on a regular basis. Um, so um, as I mentioned before, OEMs are likely to have their own infra. Um, so the, uh, but the question of how are they going to um, manage the pool of provisioning certificates is going to uh, be important. Um, are they going to be able to do that on their own or to um, do that as a service? Um, and my last thing that I like to talk about is for uh, is for CPOs and CP manufacturers. Do you develop your own model uh, modules? Um, and uh, endpoint needs to be implemented into the charging points so that it could communicate based on 15118 uh, using secure PKI. Um, this, these modules could can be developed in house. Um, I, I think a lot of the CPOs out there are are, are very good, and, and they'll be able to do it. But it, it it'll be something that's not familiar to them. So I think they would either need new 
people or or at the very least time and resources to be able to learn about these things to be able to develop these modules and they also need to be uh, updated these modules uh, because they are software so um, what we do is we offer the um, for the the stakeholders that don't want to build out their own infra we offer them a PNC service um, to be able to participate as I, any of the stakeholders uh, except the CPS um, to be able to um, subscribe and pay a, uh, a, a monthly or yearly fee to be able to uh, use our infrastructure to be able to all of this. Um, and also for um, charge point manufacturers and charge point operators, uh, we have been uh, providing software toolkits so that they could just implement that into the modules, into the modems that are already in their OCPP 2.0, for example, um, charge points. Um, so those are the, the, the key questions. Uh, thank you very much for listening. I hope I was able to clear some of this up. I know a lot of people are apprehensive about this next step, um, but it's really, uh, um, uh, like uh, Nathan said, as Christian said, I, we think this is a very important um, step towards not only more convenient charging, but really secure mm -hmm. charging. PPI, uh, what is it? Uh, public key infrastructure, right? Mm -hmm. Why is it such a hot potato? I hear, we just heard that tomorrow there will be a big discussion in the EU about PKI. That word is coming up everywhere all the time when we're talking about plug and charge. In layman's terms, could you say why PKI is such an important thing? Because it allows everyone to be able to trust each other without any question. But there's a lot of key assumptions behind that. Um, and PKI, each PKI is its own infrastructure. So if, if you have a good PKI in a bad network that's, not, that's very badly maintained, it still pre presents a lot of security solutions, which means that they can't be trustworthy. So as long as there are some baselines, like the certificate policy um, and different areas um, where we can all come to a common understanding of what a safe PKI is, um, it's a way for us to be able to trust all of the different cars and all of the charge points out there that they really can be trusted and, and, and to be able to do um, uh, charging based on decisions that's made at the back end. Does that make any sense? It makes sense. But think about the credit card probably also uses PKI. Mm -hmm. um, a credit card be, could be stolen. Um, it could be um, used by someone else. Uh, there's always uh, the need for extra hardware and, and extra steps that needs to be um, in there. The idea of 15118, I think at least initially, was to be able to have a more lightweight but still more secure way of being able to do EV charging, which would allow mm -hmm. charging the charging process to be simpler but more secure. Okay, good. We go to the next polling question and uh, let's see what comes out and then I'll ask you your opinion on the result. So do you think that uh, plug and charge is an important step for payment convenience? So instead of using QR codes or credit cards. And while we are going through this, there is a question coming in from the audience. Is 15.11.8 the same as PKI, or is 15.11.8 a subset of PKI? 15.11.8 um, originally dealt with only with secure communications between the EV and the charger, um, but without a robust 
back end to be able to support both the EV and the charger, um, it, it really doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So think about two endpoints that are out, completely independent out there and they're having secure communications with, with each other. That, that's not really meaningful for all of the um, different stakeholders that are involved. So mm -hmm. um, the PKI is indirectly a very important part of, of the equation, but um, 15118 um, has provided us with the initial roadmap to be able to explore um, what secure communications between the car right. and the charger really means. Yeah. Okay. Then a quick input from your side when you see the poll result. 81% of the people think that it's really an important step for convenience. I think everyone can agree with that. I, I'm actually uh, quite thrilled at the result. Um, mm. I, I know a lot of people find the QR code and the credit cards uh, quite inconvenient, but I didn't, I didn't know that uh, it would provide such a uh, mm. great user convenience. And, and that's really the most important thing right now for plug and charge at this point. Um, yeah, but uh, yeah, but when we started off, we have been, just before your presentation, we checked if a plug and charge would become a game changer in increased e-mobility in the region. It was kind of 50-50. That's true. But at this, I, well, I think at, maybe maybe user convenience is 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 uh, something that that we're all kind of aching for. Um, for, mm. for the space and yeah and yeah. that's great news to us okay good thank you very much uh jason uh, we'll now jump to the next speaker thank you uh, thanks a lot uh,